research and discovery. Futurists. Exoplanets orbit other stars. Up to now, we've discovered more than 300. They're mostly planets similar to Jupiter, that is, big gaseous giants. About 10% of stars have these type of planets. Then there's the super-Earth category, very big rocky planets. About 30% of stars like our Sun could have this type of planet. And then there are terrestrial planets or planets with the mass of the Earth. If we were able to see the atmospheres of the exoplanets we discover, we'd be able perhaps to detect traces of life. The first molecule to be discovered in the atmospheres of these exoplanets was water. There's no evidence that life could have developed. We can only continue taking measurements, searching, and we'll see what comes up. On the rooftops of Paris, there's a man in search of some lofty answers. Astrophysicist Jean-Philippe Beaulieu is an exoplanet hunter. He wants to know how these planets beyond our solar system are formed and if they can support life. But first, he needs to find them. And that is easier said than done. Imagine you're standing on Mars and long, long away from Earth you see a nuclear explosion on the Earth's surface. A hundred meters from this explosion there's someone holding a lighter. You're trying to detect the light from the flame and not the light from the atomic explosion. That's the sort of exercise we're trying to do with exoplanets, trying to detect something whose light is very weak compared to something which is extremely brilliant. At La Silla Observatory in Chile, astronomers use powerful telescopes and spectrographs to isolate exoplanets using a variety of complex techniques. And then they try to unveil the secrets of the chemistry and the physics. The first information we try to get is on the planet's mass, on its orbital separation and on the star it's spinning around. And with big telescopes we can make complementary observations to try to identify signature features in the atmosphere of the planet. Finding a planet isn't easy in the first place. Looking for something in its atmosphere is really difficult. It's a new frontier in exoplanetary research. And from time to time, European experts get together to share information on their latest finds, discoveries of molecules scattered in the atmospheres of these planets. According to the Italian astrophysicist who first discovered traces of water, several have already been isolated. Today's telescopes are very good, but they mainly focus on huge, very hot, gaseous monsters that orbit stars very closely. We know many things about this class of planet. They're composed mainly of hydrogen, like our own Jupiter. We've identified a number of molecules in their atmospheres, including water vapor, methane, carbon dioxide, and carbon monoxide. We're talking here about ultra-sophisticated measurements. We need a huge degree of accuracy to extract meaningful information to understand how these atmospheres are composed. We can't see these planets nor their atmospheres, so right now we mainly use indirect measuring methods. We need to use a few tricks and make models. Computer models are bread and butter research tools for European astronomers. Finnish astrophysicist Tommy Koskinen has developed a simulator that allows him to predict how the upper atmospheres of giant exoplanets behave, whether in close or more distant orbit around their stars. What you can see here is the upper atmosphere uh, portrayed at two different orbital distances. And the temperatures in the day side really get quite hot, over 3000 Celsius. And as you take the model further inwards towards the host star, something quite interesting begins to happen in the upper atmosphere. It heats up to over 20,000 Celsius. And at this point, um, the atmosphere escapes as a fluid. Um, and this induces a, a much greater rate of mass loss than you would expect. At Freiburg in southern Germany, other European scientists are also trying to unravel the mysteries of these extrasolar systems. It was here they detected the first polarized light in the atmosphere of a hot, gaseous giant. And the astrophysicist who reported it says the implications for exoplanet research are vast. 
sticks, they become less projected, actually. Yes. Right? From these first measurements, we, we have seen that it's most probably uh, uh, molecules or atoms who scatter in this uh, light or, uh, or very small dust particles. With more advanced measurements, more color uh, involved, uh, then we can say specifically which are uh, particles, either it's molecular hydrogen or water, and uh, also determine if it's dust, and we can say what kind of dust. The Geneva Observatory in Switzerland was involved in finding the first exoplanet in 1995. Researchers here work not only to identify molecules in exoplanets' atmospheres, but also to find small, rocky planetary bodies, just like the Earth. We use several techniques to identify these planets. The most efficient, historically speaking, is called radial speed. We measure the difference in speed of a star which is disturbed by a planet. When you spin a slingshot with a stone at the end of a string, you can't see the stone, but you can see the hand moving. My hand is the star, so you can see the star moving. The bigger the planet and the closer it is to the star, the larger the effect is going to be. After four years of improving our instruments, we can now detect increasingly small planets. At the moment, that means planets four times the mass of Earth. And that corresponds to a planet one and a half times bigger than the Earth. But however complex the technology, however advanced the science, the final goal of the research is as old as the hills, to find a celestial body capable of sustaining life as we know it. It's an aim which has captured the imagination of an astrophysicist involved in finding the first ever exoplanet. Here we are looking at the plurality of inhabited worlds more than 2,000 years after the Greek philosophers were discussing the idea of a plurality of worlds, so it's not a new idea. We'll try first of all to find out if the planets are similar, to understand their atmospheres and the molecules which are the building blocks that could create life. And afterwards, perhaps with time, we'll be able to look for signs of life itself. Now we have the techniques to find these planets, to study them and analyse them. So basically we're taking an age-old philosophical question and turning it into a subject for modern science.